organisations. And in my interviews, I too encountered the anxiety about the shift of market risks and responsibility onto individuals. But while certainly Richard captured the mood of the time, in my view, the pessimism of his prognosis was exaggerated. I think he underplays the positive freeing dimensions of this move to individualisation, which Tony Giddens had highlighted in his work on reflexive modernisation. Serial employment for those who can take advantage of the labour market may well furnish new forms of identity freed from traditional normative and institutional constraints. <coughs> Be that as it may, the corrosion of character deservedly won numerous prizes and gained a wide popular readership. And part of Richard's achievement is the way he bridges different worlds and speaks to audiences beyond the usual academic terrain, which is, I'm sure, a theme that um, Alan will pick up on this panel. I remember to go, going to all sorts of people's um, homes at the time and the book was around everywhere and for many of them it really opened the door onto sociology for which I'm very grateful. On reflection, what strikes me about this book and the one of 30 years earlier is the common theme that workers can't get no satisfaction as one of our alumni, very famous alumni would have put it. The shift from blue-collar to white-collar managerial work has not resolved the problem. How we can attain, in Richard's words, interesting and meaningful work with a degree of responsible autonomy and recognised social esteem and respect. Perhaps Richard's more recent book on the craftsman provides some clues. This book is really about time, the time it takes to obtain a skill and the satisfaction of exercising it. Here he returns to the pre-modern experience of making handcrafted goods, stressing that people learn about themselves, anchor themselves in material reality through this process of making things. For Richard, one of the most insidious features of the time culture of the new capitalism is the assumption that work isn't part of life, that it's merely a way of making money. And here he draws on Hannah Arendt's distinction, his teacher, I gather, from rereading the book, Hannah Arendt's distinction between two forms of life, that in one life we make things, and in another higher way of life we stop producing and start judging and discussing. For Arendt, the mind engages once labour is done. Not so for Richard. He argues that thinking and feeling are contained within the process of making, and the issue then becomes not only of limited work hours, but rather asking broader questions about how work can be made more human. Rereading the book again, I find that it really um, speaks to my current preoccupations. And I was saying to Richard that whenever I reread the books, I read them very differently and kind of they seem to have resonance with whatever I'm working on at the time. And this has been the case throughout my career. So at the moment I'm actually working on the relationship between technology and time and thinking a lot about the widespread sense that we're living in an accelerating society. And I work on mobile phones and the internet and I'm interested in the way these feed the perception that somehow speed is sexy and being slow, taking one's time, is dull. Richard is not frightened to take this on and in The Craftsman advocates the value of acquiring skills that take many hours to perfect. I recall you say it takes about 10,000 hours or three hours a day for 10 years to really um, ingrain a complex skill. The Craftsman is another lovely book, a pleasure to read, although I don't altogether share Richard's nostalgia for craft workers as the last bastion of dignity and autonomy at work. He uses the example of Linux, Linux programmers engaged in creative, generative work. And this did certainly resonate for me. But I did wonder a bit about his focus on being absorbed in making things on technical skills independent from people skills. In the service sector, for example, women do much caring work involving emotions and deep absorption which seemed to me to fit very well, really, with Richard's discussion on the unity of, of head and hand. 
And indeed, successful computer programmers know that in order to design very good information systems, you need to be thinking about relationships between people as much as technical skills. And in fact, these things are in inextricably linked. In my view, while Richard describes his project as cultural materialism, he doesn't really reflect, this is my heaviest criticism, I promise, he doesn't really reflect, I don't think, on the way technology mediates all social relations. And uh, this is the point I've left Bruno um, to elaborate because I'm sure he will. The <laughs> he doesn't even understand. <laughs> I'm leaving, I'm doing work and employment and Bruno will do science and technology studies. That's our division of labour here. The final point I would make about Richard's work, which I've written about actually, is the predominance of male voices in his narratives. But in Richard's inimitable way, whenever I have raised this with him, he assures me that he just does this, so he's left something for me to do. <laughs> May I end by saying, as the current head of the sociology department, what an honour and pleasure it's been having Richard in the department. Building friendships with colleagues takes time. Maybe not 10,000 hours, but I think it takes a lot of time. And I'm glad that Richard and I have had the time to form a close bond. Similarly, he's been part of the life of the London School of Economics for many years now, and I'm sure he'll continue to be with us in every way. Thanks. Calhoun is just giving a new meaning to just in time production because he just typed that while he was listening to what you were saying. It'll be interesting to see how profound it can be. <laughs> or otherwise. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Why? No, I'm happy to, to embrace that quasi introduction because uh, not only do I, I love my computer, but it is, of course, a, a Senate-like computer. I've ensured that Richard himself now has one. He, he lived for a time hampered by a IBM Windows existence and needed an Apple existence, needed to integrate design with practice, to have a computer about which one could feel a sense of intimacy, but which one could also use in public life, a computer which um, uh, could be thought of as a kind of uh, craftsman's cultural object and not simply a, a pure matter of instrumentality. But enough of my computer. <laughs> Let me begin really by thanking the LSE. Um, thanking the LSE for giving Richard some wonderful years because I have enjoyed and gained vicarious pleasure in how much Richard has enjoyed his existence here um, with you and in the city, how much he has um, uh, gained uh, enthusiasm as well as connection to particular contacts here, um, and that's terrific. Let me thank the LSE also for receiving from Richard some wonderful years. I actually am more ambivalent about that. I slightly resent the amount of that reception that took place on this side of the Atlantic. But also Richard's work, which I've had the chance through our Nylon Project and others to see embodied in students and colleagues who have benefited from his personal warmth, his cultural breadth, his intellectual seriousness, and the public engagement that he brings to his work. And I thank the LSE for having the good sense to organize this event and the unpredictable uh, politeness to invite me. With his typically gracious manner, Richard suggested that I ought to speak today about myself and my own work. Knowing Richard well, however, I thought he wouldn't mind if I spoke about him. <laughs> and maybe a little bit about social science and the world. Richard is a remarkable scholar and researcher, sociologist and urbanist, he has a PhD in American studies who experienced his move to Britain as a true homecoming. He became part of the British scene in a profound, influential, and I think very happy way. 
Richard is a flaneur who loves London's streets and those of cities around the world. Indeed, he is Baudelaire's sort of urbanist, one whose strongest engagement with cities is at street level. Richard is also a salonier, or as is sometimes said here, he is eminently clubbable. At home over a good single malt, or sipping a French red, and prepared to tell you about the provenance of whichever one he is drinking and why it is distinctively the best that could be acquired. <laughs> he is the sort of person whom you want to invite to dinner and whom you hope will invite you. And if you are lucky, there will be music, for Richard is a talented cellist who studied at Juilliard before hand injuries sent him into the humanities and social sciences, a kind of permanent purgatory of which he has made the best, and to the University of Chicago and Harvard and on ultimately to the LSE and MIT and NYU and so forth. Richard is also a listener of thoughtful depth and real distinction. And I mean that first of all, I wrote that down, as a listener to music. That is that part of the pleasure of music with Richard is Richard's listening, his ear, his knowledge, his ability to comment on everything from the history of intonation through to the way in which changing librettos have shaped um, the meaning of a particular opera. But I mean that also in friendship and I mean that also in his sociological work. A lot of it is based on very good listening. But above all, Richard is a writer. He is a writer mainly in the morning in order to leave time and mental resources for all the walking, drinks, dinners, and music. But he is a writer first. This sets him apart from many other social scientists. He is simply better, I think, but more than that, he conceives the enterprise differently. He writes not simply to record the results of research, to engrave timeless truths into an imaginary record, but to communicate, to be read. I say parenthetically to you, many of you are probably social scientists, you might consider this possibility that one of the purposes in writing, one of the things that ought to shape the nature of your prose is the hope that others will read it and possibly even find that experience pleasurable. <laughs> I don't believe this is taught here or at any other university. You could innovate in social science by emphasizing the existence of readers. <laughs> For Richard, informed by his life in music, writing is a performance. Jealous colleagues think it is simply a matter of talent. These are often the same people who think great teachers simply have attractive personalities and fail to see the roles of preparation, effort, and a real desire to help students. They forget what Richard knows, 